you would please turn to your Bibles to Galatians. Paul's letter to the Galatians. And I did mention in my last message that we would be looking at the the Scriptures in which the Judaizers justified their position against Paul, but I'm going to push that off one week. I just felt Paul's concentration of his mention of the Holy Spirit here deserved a little another look at at these verses and and pointing out the significance of the Spirit in the Christian life. Galatians chapter three, verse one. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Let's pray. Father, I I need You to help me. Lord, I need my heart in this text. I need uh, Your grace. Lord, in a message designed to elevate and highlight Your Spirit, Lord, I feel an absolute utter need of Your Spirit. And so Lord, would You help us? Lord, give grace to... Serve Your people. Give grace to hear. Lord, let us be profited by our time in Your Word. In this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we primarily gave our time to Paul's overwhelming astonishment um, that we find expressed in these series of questions that begins by Paul calling these Galatian brethren foolish and bewitched. What Paul does is he hits them with this series of questions all aimed at getting them to think and to reflect upon their own lives since encountering Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I want those of you that are listening to me in this hour to do the same. Because I think what Paul's doing here is very significant. You would think, or at least I would think, if I'm going to go after confronting false doctrine, in this case, confronting a false gospel, um, that's what Paul's exposing here. One would think that doing so, you would begin that exposure by way of Scripture, right? I mean, that's what we do when we go out to the streets and we evangelize. We encounter false doctrine all the time. And what's the counter? Our own wisdom? Our own ingenuity? No, it's Scripture. We defend it with Scripture. We tear down. Truth is the instrument that tears down the lies of the devil. And I would say we want to continue to do that. We need to be faithful to rely upon that. and Not our own wisdom. and Not our own argumentation. That's why I'm not a big fan of apologetics. But, but here Paul first addresses not Scripture. Oh, he will. He'll get there. But first, he goes straight after their experience. Paul wants them processing their experienced reality, not just theory, not just truths that can easily be recited and regurgitated. And he wants them remembering what really happened to them and how that happened to them. Because by doing so, it will completely discredit any notion that they somehow still stand in need of something more than what God's already shown them, already done in them, and already provided them in His Son, Jesus Christ. 
And so I find it interesting that, that Paul doesn't take the discussion back to chapter 2, verse 16, in, in reaffirming once again that we're justified by faith in Christ. Uh, brother, why isn't, I would assume the question would have been, brothers, don't you remember? Don't you remember when you believed upon Jesus Christ to the saving of your souls and that was sufficient to save you? And Rather, he emphasizes, Paul, their life in the Spirit and how their life in the Spirit began and how it has continued in the Spirit. Paul takes them, these Galatians, he takes them to their experience at, with, as life in the Spirit. Their experience with the Spirit, living life with the Spirit. Not, not, he, didn't, he, didn't, he, he already referenced Christ in chapter 2, but now he zeroes in on Holy Spirit dwelling. And he starts this by briefly addressing at least I want to start this briefly addressing this works of miracle, this phrase that Paul uses here. Works of miracles among you. We did briefly touch on that last time. Paul mentions that because it was a reality. He wasn't, he wasn't mentioning it because oh, we kind of hope that's going to happen. You know, These are things that God does do. He mentions that because that was an actual thing that was taking place in the church. Works, the Holy Spirit works miracles among God's people. Do you believe that? Oh, how this talk makes reformed people so uncomfortable. It does. And why? Because we want a Christianity we can fully explain. We do. A Christianity that we can fully tout our own experience of. If we haven't experienced it and we can't fully explain it, well, you know, this thing just can't be. I mean, it just, it just no longer exists, you see. I mean, look over there at these folks, these charismatic crazies. Look at the kind of things they're doing in the name of God. I mean, they're saying that's this, they're doing all this in the name of the Spirit. And so, if that's being done in the name of the Spirit, and I haven't experienced any supernatural giftings of God's Spirit, like the working of miracles here that Paul speaks of in this church, well, since I have not experienced such things in my Christian life, well, then the Spirit must not be doing anything of that sort anymore. And sadly, I think if folks were really honest with themselves, that's how they become what is known in theological terms as a cessationist. That's a person who believes that spiritual gifts like speaking in tongues and healing and miracles and prophecy have ceased with the apostolic age. Now, such people have no scriptural warrant for doing so. For that position. They hold to that position primarily due to what I just mentioned. A lack of experience themselves. And listen, brethren. I'm coming to you today. I've never spoke tongues once in my whole Christian life. Not once. I've never performed what, what would be considered a miracle in my life one time. To the best of my knowledge, I've never seen anyone healed as a result of me exercising a spiritual gift of healing. However, my lack of experiencing those things does not lead me to believe those things are not possible for a Christian to experience. Or for even me to experience yet. In fact, I would, par I would borrow Paul's words here and say it's foolish to confine God to the realm of our own explainable experience and deny that what Scripture sets forth as normal New Testament Christianity is not possible today. And yes, miracles, healing, speaking in tongues was the norm for first century churches. It was. We see that here. We, we see that here. We see that in Corinth. When we have no reason to think that was the only unique place or the, those two churches were just unique with them. That sampling is a, is a good indicator that that was happening in all the New Testament churches in that first century. Now, I know that probably makes you feel a bit uncomfortable. It should. It does me. 
It, it perhaps even triggers something within to find some way of protesting that or explaining it away, explaining that a, a reality away because it's not a reality to me. But you'll be hard pressed to explain it away using Scripture. Am I right? And yet it happens. I, I've seen it. I've heard it. Even some of our favorite, our favorite preachers. Citing the charismatic movement. Making that the favorite punching bag used to dismiss any kind of supernatural reality in the life of Christians or modern day Christianity. And it's a cop out. Yeah, I could stand up here. I could go. I could stand up here for an hour and give you all kinds of uh, modern day examples that are nothing more than fake attempts uh, to replicate the Spirit's work working that he that we see in the Bible in the New Testament. That are nothing more in our day. Are nothing more than fabrications of the flesh. Sadly, there's samples galore that we could cite. We could get on YouTube right now and just be grieved at it. But using those carnal, fest counterfeits of the devil to explain away any biblical reality and expectation that the church might justifiably have of experiencing the supernatural power of the Spirit in the midst of the church today, you just have no biblical warrant for doing so. And I fear asserting such is the surest way to shut down the Spirit's power today. Oh, God, give us a Christianity we can't explain. Brethren, are, are we content to not have workings of miracles? Are we, are we content to not have identifiable gifts of healing? Are we content to not have identifiable gifts of faith? That was a distinct gift mentioned in the Corinthian church. Of prophecy? Or have we become so accustomed to living without it, so bought into the notion that it's simply no longer for us, that it's not even something we should even thirst for or even ask for in prayer? It shouldn't even really just occupy our minds at all. I don't think those gifts we find there in the New Testament churches those manifest workings of the Spirit amounted to the circus show that you might be tempted to think that it was. God used such things to magnify His power and His name and sweep souls into the kingdom. That was the purpose for it all. May it please Him to do such things in our day, brethren. Things we can't explain. Things we can't explain, we can only say it's the hand of God. And may God the Holy Spirit forgive us if, if in any way we hinder that through our own unbelief. Lord, take it away. Oh, take it away. And brethren, I know. I know we have folks here that lean far, far too much on the subjective. And that oftentimes our flesh can, can crave and be taken up with the curiosity, with curiosity and a desire for you know, mysterious things in the spiritual realm and, and thing, really things that don't require faith. People like that. They like a religion that doesn't require them to exercise faith and trust God. You know, extra biblical voices and a word from God and affirmation of signs. God wants us walking by faith, He does. He wants us walking by faith in His recorded Word that He's left us. That's what Paul is underscoring here for us in this very part of the, of the letter. A life of faith. And, and folks can, for one of miraculous and super, the supernatural, people can fabricate that which isn't even from God. We, that's what we see. We see that. I, mean, I get that. I understand that. I'm not talking about that. We don't want phony, feel-good religion. We don't want to try and make something happen. Create some false, false fire, strange fire that Jeff just brought up earlier. We don't want that. But brethren, there is a fire from God. One that, the, that comes in holy power. One that comes and licks up the water in the trench, right? It leaves the false prophets looking to be fools. Ones that puts men and women on their face. That's what happened there in Ezekiel's day or rather Elijah's day. 
One that shakes people to the core of their being and transforms their life. That's the kind of fire we want. And hear me, we can't produce it. (laughs) I can't produce it. You can't produce it. Only God can produce that. And listen, those, those 120 souls that were nestled up in that upper room on the day of Pentecost, they didn't turn the world upside down. It was holy fire that fell from above that turned that first century world upside down. But brethren, we need a Christianity just like that, that God's, that God's in, that God's working. We don't need the machinations of man, but Holy Spirit power made manifest for all to see and all to be able to identify that's God, that's not man. And I just wonder how much our lack of experiencing that is tied to our unbelief. And are limiting the Spirit of God's work in our lives by setting the bar far too low in our expectations of what God will do. Brethren, we don't want to limit God to the realm of our own experience. When Scripture places no such limits on Him, His power and the manifest expression of His power far exceeds the little box we like to try to stuff God into. Box that makes us comfortable, you know. Box that we can explain God. And yes, I I can stand here and I can explain why I think we don't see, generally speaking, regularly in the churches today, why we don't see some, some of the manifestations of the Spirit in the midst of the church today. And I've explained that in previous messages uh, that I think the primary reason the Spirit manifested His presence in the early church by way of speaking in tongues was at first to authenticate the inauguration of the kingdom. This new covenant age through the Lord Jesus Christ. But additionally, the manifestation continued as evidence that God was now working in the Gentiles. And I think as we've worked through this letter, we've seen that, right? We've seen how strongly rooted Judaism was in the minds of the Jewish people, which highlights the necessity of the miraculous accompanying the message. Adding weight to this reality that the rejection of the Gentiles was a thing of the past. That was yesterday. No more. And God's present stamp of the Spirit's work was proof of that. And so, yes, I I think we can, by observation, see and say it makes sense how and why the Spirit worked in the manner in which He worked in that early church. But brethren, we need to be very careful in suggesting the Spirit's work has ceased for good in specific ways when the Bible gives us no such word that it has. And 1 Corinthians 13 is not a sufficient word. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, that is. Because if you, get, if you keep reading down to verse 10, that which is perfect has not yet come. <laughs> so that, 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 that verse doesn't fly. And the supernatural has not been regulated to yesteryear. It's what Christianity is all about. Christianity is a religion of the supernatural. If you're sitting here today and you're a Christian, you're a product of supernatural. You are. Birth from above. New life within. That's supernatural. And even though we haven't experienced much of the outward manifestations of miracle under this roof, it doesn't mean it's not happening today. I mean, we've heard and we know, brethren, that have seen and experienced supernatural things that have taken place on the mission field that they can't even share with their supporting churches back here because they would raise an eyebrow and accusations would start flying. Sadly. Some of you have heard such things here on Wednesday nights. I don't know about you, but I want the Spirit's power to come in ways that shatters my preconceived notions about God that aren't biblical. (laughs) We pray for revival. We should. I remember Brother Pat talking about that at one time. Saying, we don't really know what we're praying for when we pray for revival. Because when the Holy Spirit of God comes down in revival, He does things that are quite inexplicable. 
He does things that take people out of their comfort zone. He does things, he, he takes the human seas of programs and tradition and organization and he parts them in ways that make people tremble. He, he upsets the apple cart, as it were. You see, man doesn't want a God like that. He wants a God that he can regulate, he can harness, he can easily explain to others. God, spare us from such a religion. We don't want that. I remember listening to Paris Reedhead's Ten Shekels in a Shirt. If you've never listened to that message, I highly recommend it. It's a great message. I've probably, I don't know how many times I've listened to that over the years. It's been a long time. But yeah, you have to get over his theological understanding of how God's glorified. Just you know, get over that. That aside, it's an excellent message. In it, he shares the story of a Chinese missionary that was visiting the States who asked, what most impressed you about your time in America? And he said, the great things Americans can accomplish without God's Spirit. What an indictment. Powerless religion. That's what he saw. And that's exactly what we don't want. Well, in all the talk of miracle, what we don't want to miss is this key component to life in the Spirit given in our text here. Again, in threefold fashion. Paul likes things in three-peat style, doesn't he? Three times Paul calls to our attention the life in the Spirit. And the one thing, no matter what the age, no matter what the time, no matter what gifting, that every Christian possesses and must possess is faith. There is a reception of the Spirit. Paul did preach a Trinitarian Gospel. Did you receive the Spirit? The implied answer to verse 2 is, yes, we did. We did through the hearing of faith. There was a reception of the Spirit and it was made so by faith. Verse 5, does He who supplies the Spirit? The primary supply of the Spirit is that of faith. And it's continuance in this process of being perfected. It's, it's not the working of miracles that supplies the Spirit, but faith that supplies the Spirit. Miracles are an evidence of that. The, the end product of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ and His resurrection was the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And yes, part of that was in the manifestation of signs and wonders. And we, we, don't, we don't want to deny that. We don't want to gloss over that. That happened. It's reality. But this life of faith is a life lived in the Spirit. Life of the Spirit produces faith. And many other graces. And this is something that's unique to the church age. The Holy Spirit was active and present under the old covenant era. However, He did not work in the invasive, abiding manner that He does here in this new church age. In fact, the reception of the Spirit is the new identity marker of this new covenant age. It's the provision from God that the law could never produce. In fact, it's the fulfillment of prophetic promise, right? Jeremiah says, I will give them a new heart. Ezekiel says, a new heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone and give a heart of flesh. The New Living Translation says, I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. I never thought I'd say this, but that's a wonderful translation. At least in that text. Because that's clearly, that's clearly the meaning. God taking which, that which is stubborn, stiff-necked, replacing it with that which is tender and responsive towards Him. Do you want to know if you're born again here today? Look no further than this right here. Do you have a heart of stone? A stubborn, rebellious heart that's past tense in your life? Do you? If you, do you? You have something that's, that's past tense that was against God and it's been replaced by something now that beats after God, that desires God, that's tender towards God. If you do, that's something God's done. That's not something you've done. 
If that can't be attributed to you. It can't be attributed to the devil. It can't be attributed to anybody else here on earth. It's a work of God. That's God's installation of His Spirit within you. And He did it to cause you to walk in His steps. He did it to cause you to follow Him and trust Him all the days of your life. You see, the big difference, and there are many differences, but the big difference between the Old and the New Covenant is the Old Covenant provided a holy, righteous standard, but it provided no power whatsoever to uphold it. To follow it. Whereas the New Covenant contains power to walk in holiness and righteousness. Prior to Christ, God dwelt in a tabernacle and a temple made with hands. In this new covenant, He now dwells in the hearts of His people. God is in the hearts of His people. And that really lies at the heart of what Paul's saying here in these five rhetorical questions. God's people are birthed by and sustained by Holy Spirit power. The law can and never will do that. It was never designed to do that. And Paul is going to move from experience and prove that using Scripture going forward here. Gordon Fee says, referring to the law, no one, one can no longer bring in the back door what Christ has clearly slammed shut at the front door. In other words, you can no longer reassert and rebuild the law when that which the law requires perfect obedience has been fully satisfied. And it was fully satisfied in the death of Christ whose crucifixion we joined when we're joined by faith to Him. And I've sought to emphasize this letter's all about how we live the Christian life. Not, not just how we get in it. Yes, justification is a critical part of that package, but this, this letter is dealing with both justification and sanctification. And really, it's the whole complete package of salvation. And we'll see more what I mean by that in the next message when we look at Abraham. But Paul's questioning here, he, he, he's pressing this issue. Is this thing done by following the law? Or is this thing to be done by following Christ? By faith? And Paul provides abundant clarity for us. Just as he did underscoring how a Christian is justified three times there in 2.16. Here, it's how a Christian is sanctified, brought into perfection. But the interesting twist here, if you will, is he doesn't mention the Galatians' relationship to Christ here, but their relationship to the Spirit. And not just their relationship to the Spirit, but their experience of the Spirit. Paul knows he's going to get their ear in the rest of what he has to share in this letter if he begins by nailing down what they know inwardly and cannot deny experientially. I mean, you guys were out there eating your gyros and lamb kebabs and you're on the broad and easy road that leads to destruction without any thought of the living God whatsoever. You were completely ignorant, far off, alienated from Him. And when I came to you with the Gospel of Christ, the Spirit of God came into your lives and you've never been the same since. I know that. You know that. And nothing, none of it had to do with Torah observance whatsoever. None of it. So stop this works of the law nonsense. Christians are people of the Spirit. That is their identity marker. That is the mark of their sonship. Look over there, chapter 4, verse 6. Paul says, and because you are sons... Paul, how do we know we're sons? God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, that's how. That's how we know. We Reformed folk tend to place so much emphasis on justification, and rightly so. Yet I venture to say none of us really, really understood what it meant to be justified the moment we savingly believed upon Christ. Did you? I didn't. That's seldom the case. But what is, what is it we understood? 
We understood conviction of sin, didn't we? Yeah. We understood our desperate need for Jesus Christ. We understood that. We understood something happened to us. Something changed. Our desires changed. Our affections changed. Our worldview changed. Our whole purpose for living changed. And all of that flows from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. It was the mark, the manifest reality that led Peter to say, then the Gentile, to the Gentiles also God granted repentance that leads to life. How did he know that? How did Peter know that? It wasn't by an interview asking them if they were suddenly able to articulate justification. That's not how he knew it. Or affirming their understanding of the atoning merits of Jesus or, or the imputed righteousness of Christ. That wasn't it. It was Abba, Father! It was the cry of the Spirit from newborn lips. It's just like that guy in John. I love John 9. I love that guy in John 9. Uh, you know, what, what happened to him? They, you know, they're all inquisitive. Wanting to, you know, they're, you know, they're wiser than them. They know the Bible. And who's this filthy, dirty old man? He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's blind. I, I love his answer. I, <laughs> this one thing I know. I, I, I don't know anything. Yes, you went to Bible school. You can quote all Scripture. I don't know anything but this. I was blind, but now I see. That's it. That's all I know. Whether he was a sinner or not, I don't even know if Jesus was a sinner or not. But I know this. I know I was blind and now I'm not. And praise God for that. And that's the mark of life. That's the mark of the Spirit of God in somebody. And so Paul turns to these Galatians. He said, brethren, you've been made partakers of the Spirit who came to you and regenerated you and transformed your life, completely changing you and changing your purpose for living. How, and how did He do that? Was, that? was that by circumcision? Was that because you all of a sudden started observing Jewish days and, and you took upon their diet? That, that wasn't it, was it? It happened as you believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It happened as you heard with faith that's how it happened. So it is in this new covenant age, the sign of the covenant, if you will, or the birthmark that you've been brought into this new covenant relationship with God is none other than the Spirit of the living God. Yes, manifest in many different ways in the new birth, but primarily manifested by faith. Faith being exercised. The Spirit of God. Yeah, you know that that most forgotten member of the Trinity? Paul certainly never forgets him. He's not embarrassed or apprehensive in speaking about him. Yes, Paul knows his work is to exalt the, the resurrected Christ, but his work is prominent. It's not a side story. The Spirit of God should not be a side story. Not reduced to whispers unless somebody thinks I'm charismatic. In these series of questions, Paul unashamedly sets forth a Christianity that is Spirit-generated, Spirit-led, and Spirit-sustained. If, we if, we if we were to abbreviate Paul's questions in the opening here of chapter 3, it would be this. Has the Holy Spirit come to you by your doing or by your believing? That's what he's after. However, there is one question here that is a particular... It has a unique focus. Verse 3. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? As I mentioned when we were going through that last paragraph of chapter 2, the content of that paragraph serves as the foundation presenting all the theological themes and, and contrasts that get developed and hashed out throughout the rest of this letter. Uh, primarily, faith in Christ crucified set against works of the law. We spent three weeks there in chapter 2, verse 16 where this is first introduced. And then Paul picks this contrast back up again here in chapter 3, verses 2 and 5. Works of the law set against hearing with faith. Same issue. Works versus faith. 
And, and what Paul's going to do when he launches into his theological arguments rooted in Scripture, beginning in verse 6, verses 6 through 10 there will be his argument to support faith as that which makes us members of God's covenant. And, and then in verses 10 through 13, he's going to expose the hopeless proposition of dependence or reliance upon works of the law. It's futile. Again, themes that were presented to us in chapter 2, verse 16. But before he gets to developing these themes using Scripture, he introduces this new contrast that's parallel to works of the law and faith found here in chapter 3, verse 3. And they are the Spirit set against the flesh. This is what he's referring to. Here, flesh. Well, you know, we see flesh in the Bible. When Paul uses the word flesh, it's the Greek word sarx. Many of you are familiar with that. Which typically speaks of the old life. The old life, the life of sin, the life of slavery under the law. When you see Paul use the word flesh, that's what he means. With the exception of occasions like chapter 2, verse 20, where he's simply talking about our physical existence. I mean, the context bears the meaning. But here, this is where Paul first introduces Sarks, using it to convey the old, sin-bound, enslaved life. It carries with it a very negative connotation here and throughout the rest of the letter when Paul uses flesh. Spirit, of course, marks the new life. Life of righteousness. A life of freedom from the law. And that's what Paul sets the flesh in contrast to. But brethren, the amazing thing here, and this really this had to shock not just the Judaizers, but Paul's readers. Because Paul equates continued observance of Torah, law-keeping, to that of flesh. And that's really, that is too hard for us to grasp. I recognize that. It's hard for us to grasp just how outlandish that statement would have been to the ears of a common day Jew when Paul wrote this. You have to keep in mind, these people equated the law to that which was holy. Because it was! Keeping the law was holy! The mere suggestion that they should even stop doing so is unthinkable. But here, Paul doesn't just say stop. He actually equates doing works of the law to living in the flesh. That's what he's saying here. Brethren, if I'm sitting there as a Jew in that day, I mean, without supernatural intervention of the Holy Spirit, opening my eyes to fully see and believe that what Paul's telling me is true, I, this, this ain't flying. It's not. Not only is it not flying, I've got Scripture to prove Paul is off his rocker. You've lost your mind, Paul. And so in our next message, I'm going to play devil's advocate and seek to convince you from Scripture that Paul's wrong in an attempt to give us a greater appreciation for the radicalness of Paul's claim here. It's radical. But, in shifting gears and closing, I want to address this phrase that Paul shares twice here, hearing with faith. Because it's not just faith set against works of the law, it's hearing with faith. Paul calls our attention to hearing. It's not sufficient that you just come here and sit under the sound of truth and hear it. Or even that you hear it and say to yourself, yep, Amen. That's true. I agree with what the preacher is saying. That's not the kind of hearing Paul speaks of, or that he's speaking of here. There's nothing saving about subjecting yourself to truth speakers. Now, you should be subjecting yourself to truth speakers, but there's nothing saving about it. Just hearing truth is never enough. Hearing must be met with faith. 
Faith. And it's such a common term. It just gets thrown around. You can walk in one church and, and you can probably walk in a, most of these churches today come out with a different, different definition of what faith is or a different idea of it by seeing it expressed. Sadly, it's greatly, a greatly misunderstood word. The Bible defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What's that tell us about faith? It tells us at least this, that faith trusts in what the naked eye cannot see, right? That's biblical faith. But then the Hebrew writer decides, you know what? A little definition is just not enough. I'm going to give you a whole host of examples of the Old Testament of what faith looks like. And Jesus does the same thing. And they do it because that's true. Illustrations can often, oftentimes do a better job of projecting the meaning of something than just a mere definition of it. And in, in BBS this year, I, I used an illustration I've used in the past to communicate faith. Um, in fact, years ago, shortly after the Lord saved me, I wrote a track and I used this, this uh, illustration. And I like it because it, it not only displays trusting in uh, faith as that which trusts in what it cannot see or is yet to be seen, but it also conveys the full commitment and investment that undergirds biblical saving faith. Not half-hearted, not just words. Oh, people all kinds... All kinds of people mouth faith. That's easy to do. Very easy. It goes like this. There was a stunt man who proclaimed he could walk a tightrope across the Grand Canyon. Actually, I think people have done that. <laughs> well, he gathers a large group of people together and asks them, how many of you believe I can walk across that tightrope successfully? Oh, and all the crowd, oh, every hand, oh, yeah, we believe. Yes, <laughs> let's see this thing. Let's go. And so he does it. Gets on there, goes down, comes back to their great delight. Then he asks, how many of you believe I can do it pushing a wheelbarrow in front of me? Again, every hand goes up. Yeah, we believe it. Absolutely. Let's go. Let's do this. He goes, does it. There and back, does it. They're applauding. They're excited. Finally, he says, how many of you believe I can do it with a man in the wheelbarrow? Every hand goes up and express belief. We believe. Oh yeah, we're people of faith. We've seen you do it. We know you can do it. And then he asks, which of you would like to ride in the wheelbarrow? Not one hand goes up. You see, all believed... But really, the falsehood of their belief was clearly exposed when the, that faith was put to the test, right? You see, it's easy to say we have faith. That's easy to do, especially in our culture. Easy to do. But mere belief like that will do no more for you than it, the faith of an atheist in their religion. Send you to hell. In fact, your knowledge of Scripture is going to give you a greater condemnation than that atheist. If that's all the faith you've got. You see, real faith is evidenced in this illustration is that which gets in that wheelbarrow. Real faith that saves your soul is a faith that is wrought by the Holy Spirit. Evidenced by a Spirit-led life that demonstrates a new heart where grace and love enable you to live out a life that reflects the character of God. Live out a life that works of the law could never enable you to do. And that faith comes, Scripture says, by what? By hearing. That's how it comes. Hearing the truth. Hearing that attends the truth. Hearing that lays hold of that truth. Hearing that fully invests itself in that truth as its only hope. It doesn't content itself to stay hidden back in the crowd quietly saying, yeah, I believe. But I'm just not as radical as this guy against in the wheelbarrow. I, I'm still a believer though. Dude, we got a lot of Christianity doing that. Standing in the crowd just raising their hand. But the real faith that God plants, it jumps out and it jumps in that wheelbarrow 
And that wheelbarrow is Jesus Christ. And it says, I believe and I'm all in. I'm all in this thing. And that's the kind of faith Paul pits here against works of the law. Not just name it and claim it faith. Not just easy, easy believism faith. It's the real deal. It's Christ. It, it's all. He's all. And so I ask you, are you all in? You have the kind of faith that has you all in this thing. There's no reservations. You don't have something held back. You're all in for Jesus. That's the only faith that matters. It's the only faith that counts. That's the only faith that's biblical saving faith. You know, we've, we've already talked about it today. Nicole knew the Gospel. Last year I had a couple, a couple of opportunities. to. She went down with me to Laredo. I think about those conversations. <clears throat> Wondering if I, I should have pressed her harder with her soul. She knows a lot, she knew a lot of truth. Only God knows where she's at right now. But she didn't enter that hospital with her parents having any confidence of where her soul was at. She would talk to you about the truth. We had conversations about it. Wouldn't shy away from it. Knew a lot in her head. Probably more than most of you. At least in her head. But she never was all in. She stood back in the crowd. Had the knowledge. Believed it from afar. Didn't jump in the wheelbarrow. And some of you, you've heard the truth over and over and over and over and over. There's no merit in that. Hearing truth doesn't help you. In fact, hearing truth damns you if you don't believe upon it. I, I just can't fathom that day we'll stand before Christ and you'll, hear, you'll see all these people that have never heard the Gospel. You know what Paul says to those people? Without excuse. They'll be damned without excuse. I can't imagine a person that has sent under the truth time and time and time and time and time again and to have not received Christ to the saving of their soul. Have not exercised faith. Not really come and put it all in the wheelbarrow. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to be a Judas who was greatly blessed and ended up damned. As Jeff said, you know, you, you young people, we got you got parents breaking their hearts back there, praying for your souls. Don't bank your soul on that. Don't don't think to yourself, mom and dad are praying for me. I'm good. Listen, Nicole had her mom and dad praying for her. She had this assembly. She had another. She had num numerous of God's people praying for her. You got to come. You got to do business with God. You have to. You got to respond to the truth. You can't afford to wait. You can't afford to put it off because you can't guarantee the next day. And I ain't trying to scare anybody into hell or into heaven. I'm trying to deliver your soul from hell. I can't do it. But you know what? The person that believes upon Christ, the Scriptures, through hearing, it's hearing the truth. That's what rescues souls. So don't block your ears. Hear and believe and respond and get out, jump in. Abandon all the things of this world that pull you that keep you keep you back in the crowd keep you with the popular crowd keep you with the worldly thinking keep you with this life that everything in it's perishing whatever that excuse is whatever's holding you back it is absolutely vain and worthless come to Christ he is the treasure of treasures what are you thinking Father, I pray, please, Lord, open up eyes, the eyes of our children, Lord, our grandchildren, Lord, our parents, our grandparents. Lord, we, we feel desperate. We, we feel we can plead for a soul and they still slip away. Lord, if You don't do something, 
Lord, please. Lord, honor Your Word. Lord, give ears to hear and hearts to receive Your Son. Please save souls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.